All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 830 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org, and you can post your questions in local chat, on the Ustream chat, or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce Kay McLennan, who will be presenting DIY build blueprints for creating engaging and effective virtual world learning simulations. Kay McLennan is a professor of practice at Tulane University. Kay started using virtual world simulations in her e-learning courses in 2008 and was a finalist in the Federal Virtual World Challenge in 2012 for her Prisoner's Dilemma game theory simulation and in 2013 for her Data Detectives game. Kay's recent presentations on virtual world education simulations include Interactive Engagement and Increasing Learning Outcomes in 3D Virtual World Educational Simulations and Activities, and Leveraging Government and Academic Partnerships in MOSES, Academic E-Learning Open Simulator Use Case, and Using 3D Virtual World Models in E-Economics Instruction. Welcome, Kay. Good morning. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to attend this informative conference set in such a splendid virtual world venue. Also, it's my pleasure to be able to share a bit about my use of the OpenSim platform in my e-teaching courses. To start this presentation, uh, I want to provide some background on student preferences for simulation types and features. Also, how to adapt virtual world builds to student preferences. Then, elements in game uh, theory, elements in uh, my scenario game, the data detectives game, um, my DIY or do-it-yourself approach, and then we'll have a long question and answer period. But first, I wanted to give a little bit of background on the Open Simulator Advantage. I moved to Open Simulator in 2012, and the first advantage I gleaned was a marked increase in the voluntary participation rates of my students. First, when I was in Second Life, my student voluntary participation rate was about 10%, and it jumped markedly to 33%, with spikes to over 50% in the last three years. And this is because I believe strongly in the OpenSim advantages, including pre-created avatars, and the avatars can have different permissions, pre-stocked avatar inventories, pre-positioned avatars, no need for X-rated warnings, more space for more simulations, and the ability to have OR files and inventory files, and also last but not least, lower costs. So turning first to student preferences for virtual world learning simulations, but interestingly, in terms of engagement, interactivity, and e-learning, increased e-learning outcomes, my top pick was not my student's top pick. My student's top pick was resource materials. And in many cases, the resource materials that I had initially put into the builds, like vocabulary flashcards, was just filler. And I, was, I can tell you, I was shocked to find out that students ranked my filler much higher than the different games that I had developed, thinking that they were the be-all, end-all. So let's start with a checklist for virtual world basics uh, when it comes to building uh, educational simulations. My students require, I teach online and sort of the gold standard for online is the ability to have asynchronous learning. So asynchronous learning is the first thing that all of my students uh, declare to be an important feature of virtual worlds. Um, however, once a student is uh, has some experience with virtual worlds, the next thing they say they're interested in is real-time sessions. So uh, it's kind of a, a schizophrenic uh, outcome there. Um, also, the need for expansive builds, and I've heard this over and over again throughout the last five years, that uh, virtual worlds have more affordances and have to be more than what a student or a class can get from either a webinar 
a Skype call or uh, now there's Google Hangouts. So they have to be interactive. Students have to be able to have uh, learning outcomes that they can't receive from any of those other um, platforms. For novices believe that the virtual world learning activities should not be mandatory and non-novice novices believe that they should be mandatory. Uh, next, uh, the slide that I've just put up is quantifying the engagement factor. I asked students now uh, a, dis a quick disclosure. Obviously, the students in my e-courses self-select themselves for e-learning and then within my online courses the students self-select themselves for virt the virtual world learning activities. I run two parallel tracks where they can continue to discuss in our uh, LMS, our learning management system text-based uh, discussions or go into the virtual world. But the interesting finding is that in terms of a Likert scale agreement with uh, one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree, in terms of engagement, classroom delivery ranked 3.5, e-course delivery or online courses 4.1, and then virtual world delivery 4.4. So almost a point higher when you compare face-to-face -face classroom delivery to virtual world delivery. The next slide, I put up a few quotes from students, uh, and I'm going to excerpt a few. I love the idea of real-time discussions. It makes the class more interesting. The virtual world presentations were more interesting and caused me to want to read and learn. I found myself wandering into other buildings not related to my class. Keeping studies interesting is a factor that will lead to a higher success rate. So students are uh, sold. Um, uh, in addition, if we look at the correlation between interactivity, engagement, and increased learning, if we look at uh, interactivity and engagement, all, all three are highly correlated. That is classroom delivery, e-course delivery, and virtual world delivery. But when we look at engagement plus increased learning, classroom delivery is only moderately correlated. E-course delivery is strongly correlated at 0.79, and virtual world delivery is even more strongly correlated at 0.87. So students like virtual worlds, virtual worlds are more engaging, virtual worlds increase learning. Returning for a second to the actual types of uh, simulations that students rank the highest, uh, resource center, vocabulary flashcards, again, these were both fillers and they both got perfect scores. The little horse that you see in the bottom is uh, to signify that they're my dark horse <laughs> simulation types. Another highly rated uh, type of simulation was Meet the Economist, where students press buttons um, on a board with, uh, that take them to biographies of relevant economists, and that ranked quite highly. Uh, gender Dynamics in the Workplace, this is another highly rated uh, type of simulation where students could relate to this simulation uh, owing to what they've experienced in their own workplace and careers and work scenarios. Turning next to the actual build and game features, the first thing that I discovered when students uh, got what they wanted, which was expansive builds, is that once they were in world, even with note card descriptors and learning management system descriptors of the available activities, cafeteria style, I heard, what do I do now? How do I find my way around? And of course, as detailed in their findings uh, earlier, there's a need for resource materials, there's a need for asynchronous and real-time activities, and a need for expansive builds. The first build feature to respond to a student's uh, interest in what to do now was the addition of a student handbook. I went ahead and created a document that detailed everything that they might uh, ever want to know about uh, the build. Next, 
what you see on the screen now, the build feature is a museum-inspired movement path. I'm going to take my cursor. The entrance to the build is here. There is a uh, on-site orientation area that newbies can uh, dash into. There's icebreakers uh, in this first hall. There's learning objectives, benchmarking, and then turning the corner, uh, tutorial stations, and then entering the game. Let me advance. And as you can also see on the left side of this slide, there's actual arrows in the floor. So there's no mistake about where they need to go. Here's a close-up of the integrated new user tutorial area. Again, this is just off the waiting area where a whole class might assemble waiting for uh, different avatars to riz. There are, there's a video clip, different slideshows, uh, avatar accoutrements, anything you might find in an orientation area or an island in a, in a build. The learning objectives again and benchmarking is available. And, of course, with resource materials, such a highly rated item in, by students, I took a lot of time putting together uh, the different tutorial stations with definitions, examples, and rules that they can uh, flip through slideshows to see. And I uh, just re received a notice that the uh, slide resin is taking a little bit along, so we'll, I'll slow that down. On the screen now is the uh, long shot of the scenario-based game, and this was the key ele evolution from the desire for both asynchronous and real-time activities at the same time. Rather than just limit the real-time activities to discussions, the game, I developed the game to be either asynchronous or uh, to be played in pairs, in groups. Uh, there are four different clue stations, so either four players or four teams can play at the same time. This is an overview. Again, I'm going to, it's a little bit of a different angle, so let me see if I can use the cursor to go in. Here's the entrance way, here's the new user tutorials off to the left, and then the movement through this first hallway is, uh, as somebody reads, left to right, uh, a waiting area, uh, icebreaker area, the learning objectives, benchmarking if desired, the tutorial stations down one hall, tutorial stations down a second hall, an entrance into the game, and after proceeding through the game, exit into the wrap-up area with more lanyap and even a few souvenirs. In building a game, the key was the narrative and the topic or issue that students have to solve. That is, should CloudBuds, this uh, fictitious product, be introduced into this fictitious marketplace, which is a fictitious city called New London. Each time uh, clues are found throughout the game board playing area, there's little rizzers, individual rizzer buttons. And if you look up to the top left and top right, or top right, you can see one of the four button rizzers. Also, in the top right hand corner of the sets that are surrounding the slideshow in this auditorium, you'll see a one sample clue analysis station. And there are, again, there are four uh, pinwheel fashion clue analysis centers, and when a student or a team finds a clue, if they're group one or student one, player one, they touch the button for that clue and it rises on the clue analysis board. 
The other media on a prim features on in the Clue Analysis Center include a calculator, which is used in calculating the rents, for example. There's uh, also a stopwatch up, stopwatch down, if that's relevant to the game and play. There's a whiteboard and also a, a clue analysis uh, check mark where the students can keep track of how they evaluate the clues that they find, whether they're pluses, minuses, or question marks. On the screen now are four different uh, scene examples. In the top left-hand corner is the Ministry of Business Registration. And so the types of uh, clues that students ferret through include uh, ease of registering a business in this fictitious uh, city. And as you can see, there are lots of other avatars, uh, NPCs uh, waiting around, and there's a long wait time uh, as detailed. Take a ticket. As well, there are different signs for austerity, austerity measures that have reduced the available staff. Um, but in, in short, the wait time is probably equivalent to the wait time to get your uh, uh, license renewed in the United States. And so maybe some students might not think this is such a you know, long wait after all. Um, in clockwise fashion, number two is the rents. That's an important feature. Uh, since this is New London and I created the game while the London Olympics were underway, I ended up with a castle, a crown castle, and uh, some uh, clues related to the royals' uh, influence on culture and the community. Uh, again, this is just a close-up of the clue riser buttons and uh, where the little blocks riz. And each, time, and each time a button is pressed, a note card is given. Also, if the note cards are lost in an inventory, uh, the players or students can touch any of the boxes that riz upon their little clue analysis center to get a duplicate note card. There's a long shot of uh, Clue Analysis Center. And again, it's up in the far right corner of the set that's surrounding the slides. After the game is played, uh, the wrap-up uh, can occur uh, as a real-time discussion with different team boards uh, set up. Or if the game is being played asynchronously, students are going to need to provide their instructor with some kind of feedback on what their analysis is. Also, in the lower right-hand corner of the 3D set surrounding the stage is a rubric that uh, provides guidance on grading uh, the evaluations that uh, students come up with and, you know, feedback to them as well. And, of course, there's also a post-game uh, assessment possible. Um, one of the features of this game, which may end up being a little bit of overkill, but it was fun to build, was a dual instructor control center in a hot air balloon above the game. Every uh, whiteboard has a duplicate address and, uh, you know, little screen up in the instructor control center. And it was fairly easy to do the same with the, uh, all of the uh, different clue analysis uh, boards, uh, the blocks as they riz down on in the student level, they also riz simultaneously in the instructor level. And the reason for this is if there's a large group playing, the instructor or the uh, T -T TA monitoring play can uh, speed up or equalize play as needed and, and of course provide assistance and send out note cards. Turning next to my favorite, the DIY approach or do-it-yourself approach, um, the reason why I ended up uh, on this, uh, using this approach to all of my 3D builds is that I fear nothing would have gotten done working with an emerging technology had I not done otherwise. Uh, if the getting the islands funded first in Second Life and now a grid funded in Open Simulator 
it takes all the energy I've got and getting additional resources at my institution for uh, interns and assistants and other help is just beyond, uh, you know, what is possible with an emerging technology. But uh, I'm very happy that I've gotten funding for the islands. Again, students respond very favorably to what they've experienced so far. So looking next at at a DIY uh, do-it-yourself approach, there's four uh, aspects to it. One is the platform itself, uh, self-hosting or hosted. I'm not going to discuss this much because I use a hosting solution myself, uh, a hypergrid business. The second is a state, region, or grid management uh, tools. Um, third is the actual creation of the physical space. And then last is the creation of the build and learning materials. When it comes to region or grid management, there's really no, I, I've just sort of assembled uh, kind of a hodgepodge here of um, different items. There's no, uh, you know, um, nothing better than actually just experimenting with the region tab and the land tab in your region to figure out all the different settings and what they all mean. Also, there are resources that were first uh, um, targeted towards Second Life, Scripting Your World, the official guide to Second Life, Creating Your World, all excellent resources that I purchased. And one of the things that it wasn't my original thought, somebody suggested that you can get copies of these different uh, resources on half.com or used books for even just a couple of dollars a piece. So that's another place to start. Um, there's the Fleep World Wiki. Um, there's also a very good resource, the Open Sim School Quick Start Guide. I put the link in the note card uh, that you can take a copy of. Moving on to the physical space, um, boy, there are so many resources now. Open Sim creations for ore files, terrain files, um, texture files. Uh, is one Linda Kelly uh, or files for just an assortment of really great um, uh, starting uh, content that you can modify and change as well. I'm a fan of the Open VE builds. Um, uh, I have a, a website a link in the note card, and I always like to give a shout out to Clever Zebra. Um, back in, gosh, 2008 was when the Clever Zebra just first gave their freebies away in SL. And that was sort of the light bulb above my avatar's head that I could do this myself when they gave out their freebies. Um, in the note card, I've also provided links to some of my favorite OS Grid shopping spots. Uh, Wright Plaza, Maldive Island, where I got some great castles and Tudor buildings, and Vibina's Emporium on Steam, and also some places that I can't get to anymore. I don't know whether they're offline or what um, the deal is with that. Um, in terms of my wrap-up, all I can say is uh, two enthusiastic thumbs up for Open Sim. Um, if we look at the open sim advantages, uh, repeating what I had said earlier, the ability to pre-create avatars with different permissions for hypergrid jumping and just about anything else is a decided advantage. The ability to pre-stock avatar inventories with note cards and other educational materials, like for example when I'm playing the uh, uh, free trade game to give them the widget components. Um, Pre-positioning avatars right in front of where they need to be. I don't have to include any X-rated warnings. Um, there's much lower costs. I've got more space. And the ability to make and use uh, ore files and inventory files is invaluable. Looking at the student advantages, of course, there's increased learning outcomes, increased engagement, uh, experience with a platform that may benefit students in their future work efforts. And that's something that I've just come to realize uh, is important to students. And not only that, uh, uh, this is almost a, a funny revelation. Recently, students started uh, telling me that they took my particular 
finance course or economics course in lieu of another uh, section precisely because of the virtual world component. And I have to say at first, you know, and, and to to this day, that kind of disturbs me because, you know, I spend so much time building and creating all these virtual worlds and managing the grid all by myself. And, and you know, that was okay when it was just my choice. But now all of a sudden, there's this sinking feeling that students are depending on it. It sort of changed the equation slightly, but I'm hoping to get over that, uh, that you know, the fact or get over the thought that I have to keep doing it. Um, in terms of the instructor benefits, um, there's, it's kind of a lanyap thing or something extra for my students. Now, not that I uh, did this to set out to pander to my students, but it doesn't hurt that, you know, I get lots of uh, accolades in my student evaluation of teaching about the virtual world component. Um, I feel it's just increased my creativity a uh, hundredfold. Um, and as I've ended up making more and more of my own virtual world sets, I've ended up making more and more of my own teaching ancillary material. And I find I'm less reliant on expensive textbook solutions and really hope to, you know, move my teaching materials and textbooks away from expensive uh, textbook solutions into more open source and my own materials. And then finally, the do-it-yourself advantages um, and they're connected to the instructor advantages. There's kind of a case for the need for basic knowledge of virtual world platforms as essential to the creation of effective learning simulations in this platform. And of course, DIY is best suited to the platform because OpenSim allows instant changes. So when you're using a platform that allows instant changes, the instructor needs to know how to make those changes. And of course, it uh, sped up my development. I wouldn't have been able to have gotten this far this fast if I was relying on extra funding for assistants and other uh, workers. So, all right. That completes my formal presentation. Now we can get back to questions. And if I've missed any questions uh, since we came back from uh, when the stream was lost, the recording stream, please do type them again in the, the chat. I think we've got uh, 10 minutes here for uh, discussion and chat. Any comments, too? Uh, any sharing uh, similarities? Um, we've got several of our presenters uh, that are going to follow my talk sitting in the audience, Rachel and Ramis, and probably more as well. Um, any comments and questions? George adds, once I had an interesting discussion with a cyber psychologist, yes, there is uh, such an occupation. We were wondering if the people who spend a lot of time in virtual worlds need less dreaming in real life. Um, gosh, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody in the audience have the answer to that? Ellie asks, what would you recommend for those of us teeter on the edge of starting up an OS? I'm wondering how hard it is to manage your own grid and what are the best options? Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, my response is that a hosted solution may be uh, one way for you to easily get up and running in OpenSIM. And Ellie adds, uh, uh, answers George questions. I find building augments my dreaming exponentially. Um, I'm going to come back to George's question. I just know when I first started working in virtual worlds, with the ability... Yes, I've been asked to repeat George's question. Um, George asks, once I had an interesting discussion with a hyper psychologist, and yes, there is such an occupation, we were wondering if the people who spend a lot of time in virtual worlds need less dreaming time in real life. And Ellie answers George, at George, I find building augments my dreaming exponentially. Um, and Stephen, and uh, the second question asked, uh, Ellie was asking what is recommended for those of the audience that may be teetering on the edge of starting up an open sim. And Stephen is responding to Ellie 
to find support groups, including hosting solutions and the G plus communities. That's an excellent uh, tip. And uh, another tip, there's the different listservs that I, uh, Stephen, just jotted my memory. Um, the OS uh, uh, OpenSIM Educators List Form, the OpenSIM Users List Form. The Users uh, List is primarily for technical issues. I su subscribe to both. But uh, And there's a, a, a one, there's a different format. The SLED Listserv, you find people, uh, gosh, uh, repeating when they respond, you know, uh, uh, repeating 15 messages, and they'll shout you down <laughs> in some of these new open sim serves. You have to just copy over the one sentence or two at the top of your reply that you're responding to, and then uh, put your answer underneath it. Okay. Um, Rachel asks or comments, what are the essential components of the DIY team? Well, the essential, my DIY team is me, me, and me. Um, I am the scripter builder, grid manager, content designer, all wrapped up in one. Um, yes, uh, uh, the only difference I, is that I'm not the platform hoster. I, that's where, for the moment, that's where I draw the line here. And I'm sure we're going to hear from Rachel. She's probably the chief cook and bottle washer, too. Um, George is responding back to Ellie. I use Diva's universal campus distribution, fairly easy to set up. This is what we use for virtual Caltech. Students find it easy to use and manage. Um, this is uh, the breakout zone that we're in now is uh, a, a modification of part of the universal campus. Um, and this is back at you, George. Um, the universal campus is a mega region build. It when you bring it into your grid, it goes over four sims. And I had the devil of the time. I was experimenting with it one day, and I put it in at the edge of my, and I thought I had only gotten one of the islands, but I put in all four islands, and they poured over my grid, and there was no way to remove them, because every time I tried to remove one of the prims, it would grow back again. So finally, the solution I had was to upload a blank OR file, and it erased it. So uh, what I would really like is the universal campus broken up into four individual OR files, just a wish list there. Um, but the universal campus items are uh, beautiful. Um, just like the swag items that came with this conference, I thought we, we got some great uh, items there. Um, Ramesh asks, uh, how much of the physics in SL do you miss in OpenSim? Um, I missed the car physics until I realized that uh, I found an open source script recipe for wearable uh, cars. Uh, in my Prisoner's Dilemma uh, simulation, one of the learning activities is a chicken game where uh, the students have to face off uh, with the cars, uh, you know, something quite dangerous in real life, but not dangerous in an open, uh, in a virtual world simulation. And I had a devil of a time. I was trying to get the car script to run, and it would only run on the X... Uh, on the X, Y axis from, uh, you know, Y to X. It was uh, on the X axis from East to West. That was what it was. But it still, it, it didn't even work right. But all of this is going to change very soon when uh, the bullet uh, uh, physics engine, which I get the sense is even better than what is in Second Life now, is going to be deployed. Let me see what else... Um, I'm missing here. You, Paul uh, comments, you mentioned that sharing content in OR and, I, and inventory files is an advantage of OpenSIM. Is it possible to share, is it not possible to share content already created and available in the Second Life marketplace? Um, you can only export from Second Life what you create are both the creator and the owner of. So, uh, the, uh, and, and actually, as a rule of thumb, that's exactly what you need to be doing in OpenSim, unless you've got explicit 
uh, permissions to do so in OpenSim. But a Second Life, it's really hard to get content out. If, uh, you know, if you, even if you purchase it, you can't get the content out. Um, George comments, just find some students who are good with computers and games and they're good with this. Um, I, I agree. Uh, Stephen washes most of Rachel's dishes and keeps up the kitchen. All right, let me get down to here. Um, blank ores are essential. Yes, I've learned that. Um, any final questions or comments? This has been a great audience. Um, I've enjoyed uh, hearing your comments and questions. And we can always go back to Ellie. Does anybody have any advice, uh, more advice for Ellie, thinking of, uh, I assume, perhaps leaving uh, Second Life and coming into Open Sim? It, wait till you... It, it, I, I'm excited for you, Ellie, to be coming into Open Sim. Um, the hosting service that I have has a web page interface, and so you can just upload an OR file, download an OR file, um, and it's so fun. I, you'll spend an entire day going through all of the Linda, Linda Kelly files, um, and just a basic setup in OpenSim is four islands, so think about that. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have four islands to play with and you won't know what to put up and pretty soon it will go to eight and probably twelve. So, Well, thank you all for your attention and uh, if there's any other uh, comments, we've got two minutes. Um, Ellie comments, seems to me that those of us who know our way around SL are hesitant to lose all that expertise. It's been great for confidence building. I, I agree. I, Second Life got a lot of things right, um, and I enjoyed, uh, I, let's see, I was there for two years. And, you know, I still have an avatar, my main avatar and my inventories. Um, I, a lot of things that I purchased in there that I can't take out. And there's, you know, some events I uh, duck in to see. So it was a great way to start. I agree. And the one thing about the DIY approach is that the one, the individuals I observed, I don't know whether I, this is, this is an unscientific observation, but it seemed like the ones that had the least money and had to do more themselves in Second Life were the ones best suited for leaving early uh, and going into Open Sim. But Open Sim is very stable and robust now, so enjoy. Uh, Stephen has just asked a question, what degree programs are students in typically, all School of Continuing Studies, right? Um, most of, the st of all the students in my courses are School of Continuing Studies courses, uh, but I do have some uh, day school students at Tulane or other students uh, in Newcomb Tulane in my courses. There's a bit of a... a uh, cross-pollinization where our students can take uh, day school classes and vice versa and we've just uh, started uh, allowing uh, Newcomb Tulane students to major in several of our School of Continuing Studies programs. I teach business studies courses and the three main courses I teach are economics, finance, and ethics. And those are the three courses that I've built individual simulations for. I have individual buildings set up with different simulations related to the middle part of the material in the course. And the, uh, it's cafeteria style. And that's how I started. And now the Data Detective School is an example of me moving into more of an immersive game uh, environment. And what I'm trying to do is, uh, in the future, compare students' views of uh, cafeteria style versus the game style. I think we're still holding for the recording to come back on. Any other questions? Did that answer your question, Stephen? Oh, and they are undergraduate, yes. It's all undergraduate courses. 
Rachel asks a question. Uh, do you think the increase in the number of students that volunteer would have happened anyway? Um, no. Uh, I, I thought, again, the feedback I got from my students it, when they were in Second Life was that it was really hard to get from the orientation island to uh, figure out what to do to get to our uh, individual islands within Second Life. Now, I offer up six different starting looks, three male and three female starting looks, and uh, uh, pre-create their avatars, uh, pre-position their avatars to be right in front of where they need to be, and uh, that made it a huge difference um, in the participation rate. And considering, uh, okay, Rachel expands on her question, considering the timeline 2010 versus 2013. Well, that's a good question. I uh, don't see myself going back into Second Life because I'm used, rather than having just one or two islands, I, I'm now used to having nine islands and uh, also I can it's completely private but I could have them hypergrid jump to the OS grid the platform is as stable the Vivox voice um, uh, the only last piece in the puzzle is for our new bullet engine and that's headed um, Ellie asks if my slides are on SlideShare, um, and they're not uh, right now, um, but I do have uh, one version uh, of them at this link I've just put into uh, the chat, plus uh, a link to the website. Um, and... Also, if you haven't already, there is a note card. Um, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm describing uh, the DI my DIY approach. Uh, we're waiting for the recording stream to come back. But I've just been told one more try and we'll, we'll be coming back. Let me see if I've missed any questions here. Rachel, are you in Second Life teaching? I uh, just, I, I guess I'm. Um, I'd be curious for some uh, somebody who has a more up to date comparison of uh, teaching in Second Life versus um, Open Sim. Everything works for me in Open Sim, and I, I have to say I, uh, that wasn't the case when I was in Second Life. Uh, Rachel does have builds both in SL and OpenSim. And is your experience uh, different? Uh, do you find students uh, find it e as easy to be in Second Life as in OS? And Ellie's in Second Life as well. And Rachel uh, states that she agrees that OS builds can be much more expansive and uh, at a much less cost. And Stephen adds, Rachel is dual SL and open sim right now. She will talk later at 1230 in this zone. Good. We'll, we'll all be here <laughs> for Rachel's talk. Um, thank you all. I'm going to uh, close out here and please email me uh, if you have any more questions or ping me during the rest of the conference. All right. That, that's very good. Thank you, Kay, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Uh, in this room, the next session will be virtual exercise design in immersive virtual learning environments, recent, recent emerging approaches with Ramesh Ramal. Thank you again to our speaker and audience. We'll be back shortly with the next session. Thank you.